Today's date is December 5th, 2023. My name is Chad Gibbs. I have the pleasure of interviewing Judy Burke for the USC Shoah Foundation. This is a remote interview. Ms. Burke is in New Haven, Connecticut, USA, and I am in Charleston, South Carolina, USA. Judy, could you please introduce yourself and say your first and last name? Uh, my name is Judy Burke, uh, or Judith Burke. And how do you spell your, your name? Uh, J-U-D-Y-B-I-R-K-E. What was your name at birth? It's interesting. My name at birth was Judas, J-U-D-I-S, uh, because it was on the list of acceptable names. Hmm. My mother was... I'm sorry. My mother uh, actually wanted to name me Deborah after her mother, but there was, was, as I said, a list of acceptable names that one could name children, and Judas was the one that she selected. So when I came to this country, I became Judith. What was your last name at birth? Blyweiss, B-L-E-I-W-E-I-S-S. And where were you born? In Hamburg, Germany. Uh, what was the date of your birth? October 31st, 1940. How old are you today? 83. Uh, what can you tell us about uh, your childhood in Germany? My childhood in Germany was very, very brief. As I said, I was born in 1940, and we left in 1941 when I was about 10 months old. So I only had, I guess, a babyhood in Germany that I have no cogent recollection of. Although I, we will, when we talk, um, we will, I'm sure, talk about uh, some kind of um, memory that wasn't um, a, a physical memory of doing something. I mean, it was more emotional, I think. Do you have brothers and sisters? No, I don't. And what can you tell us about your parents? I never knew my father. Um, he was killed in Germany when my mother was pregnant with me. So uh, we came, oh, my mother and I came over uh, in 1941 uh, August. We started in August and didn't get off the ship till September. Um, and uh, we had family here because that was the only way you could get out of Germany if there was someone uh, to vouch for you, so to speak, and that and say that you wouldn't become a public charge, for lack of a better term. And um, we came here. We lived with relatives on and off. Uh, first with her brother in New York, then with her sister in Massachusetts, then back with her brother in New York. And um, finally, um, we moved into our own place in New York. And um, she was a cleaning lady. And I began second grade school at that time. And this was just you and your mother that whole time? Just the two of us. If I could go back in time just a little bit and ask, uh, where were your parents from? Were they native to Germany? Both of them? My father was native to Germany. My mother was from Poland originally, and um, her family uh, moved to Hamburg when she was a little girl. What were their names? My father's name was Rudolf, R-U-D-O-L-F, and my mother's name was Merla, M-I-R-L-A. Do you know her uh, born name? Yeah. Last name? Yes. It was Lundner. Uh, L O N D N E R. Okay. So, what is your, before we go back to your story starting in the United States, I'm curious what your earliest memory is. My earliest memory is um, when I was living. I think it was in Massachusetts at the time. We lived with family. I had a cousin who was about my age. And my earliest memory is of playing with him, you know, just a, a normal childhood at the time. Uh, all right. 
let's talk about how your uh, family managed to leave Germany, because that is such a difficult process. Um, and you said uh, that you also even know the name of the ship that yeah. you came to the United States? Yeah. The ship was Muzinho, M-O-U-Z-N, like M-O-U-Z-I-N-H-O. And it, sha- it sailed out of Portugal. Um, from what I've heard and from what I understand, we left Hamburg uh, on a sealed train, passed through um, France, which was already occupied, I believe, uh, and Spain, and uh, wound up in Portugal. And um, again, from what I've heard, it was uh, the last ship that left Portugal at the time for the United States. And um, do, do you want to know details of, of how we were able to do it? Or is, okay. Yes, please. All right. Um, my, my mother applied, actually my mother and father applied uh, to emigrate a few times. Um, the first time, shortly after they were married, I believe it was in 1938 or 39, 39, I think it was. And um, somehow it, it didn't happen. I don't know the details of, how, of what happened and how it didn't happen. The second time was after they were married and um, she applied or they applied and were given permission to leave, or actually got their permission on July 4th, 1940. And that was the day that my father was killed. So that was the second time we were unable to leave. Um, The third time um, she reapplied and the gods were with us because we did not leave till late August in 1941. And um, I'm not sure exactly of of the whole process, but um, I can tell you um, some of the things that I'm aware of. Um, Obviously she had to go through this whole difficult, difficult um, process. And um, she had to fill out some forms, which I think we'll use in the artifacts, if if that works, um, of exactly what we were going to bring with us, making sure that we had paid our taxes, making sure that we had filled out all the information that was necessary to do. And um, she did that. And there's a whole list of the things that we brought, like three coats, four shoes, you know, et cetera, et cetera, all very neatly typewritten. On the bottom of this typewritten list, she noted in, in script, no longer in, um, in, in type, Un spiele für das Kind. And that is interpreted in and toys for the baby. So I had originally, obviously, just been born. And I can't help but think, if you'll allow me this, that the bureaucrat who read the paperwork and just went one thing, one thing, oh yeah, oh yeah, saw the bottom and saw her handwritten, Und Spiele für das Kind, and somehow his better self emerged and he said, okay, let's let this, these people go. You know, there was something touching about the fact that she had done that. And, um, that, that is how we got out. And you had a, you had to have a sponsor in the United States. Yeah, we had a sponsor and that was my, um, uh, an aunt and uncle in New York. And in your, in your research into how you managed to get out, did you learn a lot about how they were helping from this side of the Atlantic? No, I, d- I didn't learn anything about it. Um, I just uh, have some paperwork, some form that I saw that they 
sign their name to, but I, I don't know anything else about it. So when you arrived to the States, you, you went through a few different places that you listed that you had lived, uh, just you and your mother. Mm -hmm. uh, can you start uh, telling us about uh, growing up in those first years sure. in the United States? Uh, well, as I said, initially, um, we went to New York, and I don't really quite remember. I was quite young. Then we went to, as I said, Massa in New York, we were with her, living with her brother. Then we went to Massachusetts with her sister. And as I noted, um, her sister had a young boy who was about my age, and we became really good friends, and that was a, quite a pleasant uh, upbringing or a pleasant situation. Um, I felt very close to him. And we went, we started uh, actually first grade together. We went to school together and it was all wonderful. Now, it I, I don't know if it was wonderful, but I enjoyed it. And um, the interesting thing as we go on and talk about my emotions and feelings throughout my life, I tend to wonder um, that when we left Massachusetts and came to New York, just the two of us, what that was all about. He was like a brother to me. It was almost like I lost this guy, you know? And um, as, as we speak, um, we can talk about how I felt about losing important people, in this case, males, uh, in my family um, from time to time and what, what it does or did. And, that, and you want me to um, talk about New York, came to New York, and that was quite difficult. I was in the second grade, and I knew I was different. I... I wanted so much to be an American, and there was something in me that said, you're not an American yet. You're, the people with whom you, you associate speak with accents. Um, you have to raise your hand in the classroom when a teacher says, are there any aliens here? Yeah. You learned to get a, a bathroom pass when you knew that was going to come up the first week of school. And I knew that I was different. Um, at that time, um, students didn't have a, sing one, a single parent. They all had families. They all came to the Parent Teachers Association meeting. And my mother came alone. And she spoke with an accent. And she was very different. And I didn't quite understand it. And so at that point, I think I got angry. I was puzzled. I was ashamed. I knew I was different. And, and that's how school began for me in the United States. About what year might it have been when you were uh, in grade school? Uh, well, let's see, I was born in 1940, so I'd say it was about uh, 47, 48 that we're talking about. So I think we should also just get uh, out for everyone's info. Um, do you recall speaking German or would you basically begin your memories in English? I don't recall speaking German. I don't think I ever really spoke German. Um, German was spoken in the family, in the, uh, in the house among the family. Um, but first of all, I was so young that um, I guess I learned English by choice because I didn't want to speak German. It was another um, uh, stone in the, I, want, I don't want to say coffin, whatever. Uh, it was another aspect of my being different. I wanted to speak English and I learned English and I didn't want my mother to speak English and that embarrassed me that my mother spoke English. So um, yeah, so I, 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 I understand German still but I don't really speak it. Hmm. How fast was your mother able to, to learn English? My mother was amazing. Um, oh, can I throw in something 
from our last uh, subject matter about me coming to the state, uh, to the United States. Um, apparently, we were not getting our uh, visas or whatever it was that was necessary for us to finally get out. And among my father, my mother's artifacts, as it were, um, after she passed away in 1973, I found a letter and essentially it said, hey guys, listen, I filled out all the work. I did everything that I was supposed to do. I got to get out of here. I have an appointment with the American consulate and um, you're keeping me from that and I'm not going to be able to leave. And I tried to come to City Hall to speak with you. However, there were barricades and I was unable to do it. And so if you don't mind, would you send me the paperwork that I need to get this visa and please send it via with by courier because I can't get there. Mm. And, and we got it. Right. So I, I just love to tell that story because it just says so much about her. Yeah. Okay. So now we're, we're back at, uh, where were we at, at school at, um, what were you asking? Um, about her process of Americanization, if you want. Okay. Uh, about learning English and starting work here. Yeah. How be life in the United States worked for your mother? Well, I'm I'm not exactly sure. Um, after we left the homes of uh, in Massachusetts and in her brother's home in New York, we moved into our own little place in Manhattan. And it was one room and like a little kitchen area and um, a bathroom that we shared. We had an oven, we had a sink, but we had no refrigerator. That was in the hallway down the alley where the fumes uh, rose from the boiler down there. Um, and, and, and that's where we lived. Now, Across the hall, there were other families of the same ilk. There was a woman with a child, native uh, to the United States, and a, another man and his wife. And the interesting thing about that, um, as I said, the refrigerator was in the... Um, in the, in the hallway outside of our apartment. We each had shelves, where two shelves, where we each could put our food. Um, the, the woman with her daughter um, ate all their meals out so they didn't have any, um, any food in the fridge and they didn't have a, a kitchen. Uh, the others we rarely saw, but, and again, the woman with the daughter used to have to come into our apartment to use the bathroom. We shared the bathroom. So, but it was a really great time because I didn't know any different. And I loved, I got to love these people. They'd come into the bathroom, we'd talk, we'd meet at the refrigerator, I'd get my uh, brown paper bag of lunch that my mother put in every day so I could go to school. And it was, a family, we didn't know we were poor. I mean, I didn't know I was poor. And um, again, I'm so grateful to my mother because she never made me feel poor. I thought I was just like everybody else, even though, though I didn't have all that they had. And um, she, uh, I went to school, she became a cleaning lady. And I thought that was cool also because on school holidays, I'd go to the people's homes and hang out with their kids. So, so much has to do, I reiterate, with the attitude that the other people have, that my mother had. She brought me up to believe I, I was great. So what if I got my um, uh, lunch bag from the fridge with other people's shelves and, and so on and so forth? And so what if she cleaned the homes while I went to hang out with these kids? So, um, then, and then she went to, um, a bookkeeping school at night and learned bookkeeping and eventually became a bookkeeper. Do you know what, uh, your parents did for a living before, uh, was this a come down for them? Oh, yeah. Do you think your yeah. mom had to 
adjust to new circumstances or was it much more of the same? No, it was a come down. Um, my father um, was a sales representative for some uh, company in, in, in Hamburg. I'm not sure. I do know the name. It's called Dreyfus or Dreyfus. And um, my mother uh, worked uh, in, in a, I believe, a, um, a, a fashion house, as it were, you know, um, as in sales or, or whatever it was. So, and their family uh, were, from what I understand, quite well-to-do, prominent people in Hamburg, well-known, nice, good people, and um, that that's a sen- that's what they did. Um, when when we came to the state, the United States, and um, as I said, she was um, a cleaning lady. She never ever made me believe or made me feel that it was a a a, a lowly job. You know, I, I thought it was just fine. So she she didn't kind of rue her her situation. She adapted well. She didn't rue her situation at all. As a matter of fact, I mean, I've heard typical of other survivors. She never ever spoke about it. I knew nothing. I knew I knew we were different, but I didn't know any of the details. She never ever spoke about it. And okay, we were really poor, but. Every year for her birthday and my birthday, we went to a Broadway show, right? First, we went to Horn and Harder Automat, got our lunches, and then we went to a, a, a musical theater show and loved it. And no matter what, that was part of our, our yearly routine. We went to the Thanksgiving Day Parade. We did all sorts of wonderful things that made me feel the same as everybody else in that aspect of, of my life. So no, she didn't root it. She never spoke badly about anything. The only thing she would say is she wouldn't buy cheese that was made in Germany, okay? And she wouldn't buy a Volkswagen because it was made in Germany. It all didn't matter because she never learned to drive and I liked them, and she liked American cheese. It was all fine, you know? And the one amazing thing that she taught me was never to hate. I mean, I have seen and heard people, even when I was a child, talk about the war, the Nazis, all that stuff. And of, of course it was horrendous. But she never ever said anything that made me feel negative about anybody or anything. I really, really learned what a good person can be and that hate is not necessarily something that we all have to share in. Wonderful. Yeah. I want to ask, um, because you say that she didn't talk about what they had been through a lot, and I think that's uh, rather common, mm-hmm. but does that mean that she also didn't talk about your father much or tell you about uh, him? Essentially, yes. There was a big photo portrait about 12 by 15 or something like that um, that was hung in our room above our bed, and I knew that was my father. And other than that, no, she did not speak a lot about him until till probably perhaps when I asked, although I didn't ask that much. Um, so no, I, I, I think that's the case. I've, I've also, uh, spoken to young survivors who had the issue of extended family come up in conversations, asking their parents maybe why they didn't have grandparents or, um, aunts and uncles. Did that ever come up in your home? Uh, no, because I did have aunts and uncles. The mm-hmm. The people in, in New York were my mother's brother and his wife, and the people in Massachusetts uh, were my mother's sister and her husband and, and actually two sons. So I never, um, 
I never suffered from lack of family or thought about it. I had no grandparents, but it, that didn't come up and it, it wasn't an issue. Okay, so if we could go back to talking about your early years in school, um, you we're talking about your feelings of being different. Mm -hmm. uh, I wonder if maybe we could start back up your story about school by asking if it was that permanent or did you feel that kind of change over time? That's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure about that. Um, I knew for some time that I felt I was different. I, 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 I didn't voice it or anything like that but I didn't feel the same as my friends. Um, as I got older, I tried um, to fit in and assimilate as such, and I, I managed to do it quite well. As I got older, older, closer to where I am now, I started to think about it again and felt that, um, I, don't, I don't know if the word different is right, but I felt like I didn't fit in often. And sometimes that was good and sometimes that was bad because having been exposed to my mother and her personality, her persona, whatever it was, I, I learned such good things, such good attitudes, such good to, to to be a nice person, as it were. So um, although I felt different, I lost some of that shame and difference as as I as I got older. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So how about uh, just telling us more about as life went on in your childhood? Um, through into high school and those years? Oh, again, um, I had, I think, a good childhood, except those moments when questions came up. But again, I was always interested in art, and I used to draw and so on. And sure enough, I think I was in junior high school, and we did not have money again, but there I was going somewhere to some artist studio in Midtown Manhattan where my mother was paying for me to get art classes. And I enjoyed it. And the interesting thing is when I hear a lot of people talking about immigrant parents and how much their parents sacrificed for them and their feeling that they needed to somehow repay them or, or do, do well. I never felt that. I never mm -hmm. felt that my mother was sacrificing. I never felt that I had to repay her somehow. That can be good and that can be bad because sometimes I became angry because of her difference. The fact that she never rooted and never um, made me feel badly about it probably gave me permission somehow in my head to not be so nice to her. You know, I, I often felt, I didn't feel, but in retrospect, I realized that I was not particularly nice to her. I was at times angry at her, um, but um, um, I think, I'm, I'm not sure what I, uh, take me back to what you were asking. Yeah, um, well, let's, how, how oh, did that relationship with her change over time? Okay, well, that's interesting. Um, so I took the art classes, and in New York City, there's a, a high school called High School of Music and Art, which is a very um, well-known uh, school where you have to get in through your talents and so on and so forth. And once again, I, I really didn't think about where I was going to go to high school. I lived where I lived. I'd go to high school at some place. Lo and behold, I, I don't know exactly the details. There I was 
taking the test and doing the stuff that needed to be done to get into the High School of Music and Art. And I got in. And um, again, it brings me to this place where I think of this gentle woman, this courageous woman, this giving woman, who, who, who never made me feel like she sacrificed, who made me feel, yep, this is just part of our lives. And you like art? Ah, let's try to get you into this school or whatever it is. You take the test um, or, or, or you go to this artist studio and, and, and learn. So, um, however, as I got a little bit older, I think I began to be more aware of her differences, perhaps our differences, you know, now was a period when I would go to friends' homes or spend time with friends' family, and I realized, yep, there's something different. As much as she comforted me and made me feel secure, at some point as I got older, I, I knew there was something different. And I think that began a period when I was angry at her. Yeah. And um, I don't know that I took it out in a terrible way, but I do remember feeling, why isn't she like everybody else or like all my other friends' parents? And um, so our relationship, as good as it was for a long period of time, remained okay, but... One thing I'm going to throw in, because she never spoke of the dark side of her life or the sacrifices or anything, um, it, it, I believe when I look back on it that she obviously was hiding emotions or not letting me see feelings. And I think that my whole life until very, very recently when I started learning about myself and this and that, I also um, tried, not tried, not, it, it just happened. I didn't know what it felt like even to love or, or to, to be hurt or to hurt somebody or to uh, suffer pain or, or, give pain um, because I decided that um, I learned very early on that it wasn't good to feel too much. Mm. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Okay. But I, I didn't know it outwardly as I said until relatively recently I I didn't realize that I wasn't feeling, and I believe she wasn't feeling. And so we never really got that close because we never spoke about feelings, relationships, and, and, and her prior life and, and our current life, you know? So um, that's what happened. And unfortunately, she died quite young. She was, it was in 1973, she was 63 years old. So um, as reasonably good a daughter as I was, there was so much better that I could have been, I feel. You feel like you learned to be quite guarded from the way that she was trying to protect maybe herself and you at the same time? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I feel that I had become guarded and, and, as I said, unable to expose my feelings or even to feel. You know, that's relatively new in my life and um, so new that it, it until I had children and a grandchild, I, I really wasn't good at feeling. Yeah. But I've come to learn 
and I'm great at it now. Um, so much so that it may be too good because it's painful sometimes. Did your mother ever remarry or? She did. Uh, when I was in college, um, and, I, and I guess I was just as self um, able. I mean, I was able to figure things out just like she was because I knew we couldn't afford to send me to college. And that would mean I'd have to stay in New York and figure something out. But I was smart enough to know, like, just like her contacting the people in City Hall and saying, hey, dudes, you know, do something. I was going to find out a place where I could go out of town free. And lo and behold, I did. I found a college in upstate New York, Alfred University, um, that was, uh, they, they, Part of the college was a state university, and it was a ceramic school. I didn't know anything about ceramics, but somehow I managed to convince them that I knew about ceramics and that I was worthy of going to that college, and I went free. So um, I, interrupt what I, I interrupted what I was saying, but... Um, it was just... Are you talking about uh, her remarrying at the oh, time? Oh, right, were... right, 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 right. So I was in college, and she was going out with different men from time to time, um, which didn't make me happy at all. Didn't like any of these guys. Um, not that there was anything wrong with them. It was just I didn't want my mother to be with another man or a man. And finally, um, she did marry Sam. And I was angry. Um, I decided I didn't like Sam. And when, when I think about it now, there was nothing really wrong with Sam other than that he loves my mother and wanted to marry my mother. Um, but I was not easy. You know, um, you know, we are all sorry for some ways that we behave. Um, and that's one of the, the things that makes me sorry. Uh, she died before he did. And um, I, I was civil, I was fine, but I wasn't as good a daughter, whatever you want to call it, as, as I could have been. And, and that's one of my... Um, sorrow, so to speak. You know, um, because I think it would be important to how they spoke uh, if Sam was a Holocaust survivor. Yes. Uh, I don't know any of the details. He came from Germany. Um, I presume he was. But I never spoke with him about it. And I never spoke with my mother about his uh, history or anything. Um, he had never been married before, um, but he was about the same age as she was. So I, I, I presume he was, but I, I, I know nothing really about him. Did she, um, did she ever begin to speak more about uh, her past before her passing? Or no, she, about the same? she never spoke about it at all. Um, and I, I'm trying, that was in 1973, so, um, no, she, she never spoke about it. Um, by then, I was married and had a child, uh, two children, and um, <clears throat> we saw each other. We spent time together. Um, my husband was a difficult man, but in retrospect, maybe he wasn't so difficult, maybe... I, you know, was difficult also, but that's all beside the point. Um, we didn't spend that much time with them, but we'd see them, and um, the subject never arose. I want to go back to uh, difference or different. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you spoke about your, your relationship with your mom and, and kind of thinking of her as different and that being a an issue. Could you kind of explain what you meant by different? Yeah. 
Yeah. Is that with you over time? She, she spoke with an accent. And um, I hated that because she was different, I was different. When it came to go to temple for Jewish holidays, we went to the temple where all the German people went or the different people. And that embarrassed me and made me ashamed on, on some level. Um, so, I mean, it's not that she was that different as a human, as a personality, although I've told you a lot about her as a personality, um, but just the aspects of her stuff that she couldn't help, you know, of her life, of her, up, up, her upbringing, um, were, were, were troublesome for me. So that's essentially what I, I mean as different. Really, it was different. Right? You mean? Yeah. Um, so we were at about when you were in college. Um, you were at a ceramic school. Yeah. I understand you also got a master's degree. Did you do that right after? No, no, I bachelor? got the master's degree um, uh, long after when I was married and just decided that's what I wanted to do. So I got a master's degree in, um, in communication. Don't ask me what that means or what I learned, but I, I, I have that degree just because, right? Okay. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's not even relevant. It was something, I don't think I'll get a master's degree. I'm married, have kids, it would be, you know, something to do. And, 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 I, and I did that. Okay. Uh, Liam? Yo. We take a break, do a cut here. For break. And we're coming back from a break in our interview with Judy Burke. And we wanted to go back and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, your mother's character, uh, some of her her work to get you out of Germany and what it showed about her. You, what did you want to tell us about that? Yeah, this is really interesting. Remember when I told you about her character, how she told the bureaucrats, you know, get me out of here, send a courier because I can't get in. This is one thing that is really quite amazing, I, I believe. When I went through her photographs uh, of me as a baby, there were two or three uh, that were obviously taken in a professional photo studio uh, of me by myself, of me with her, and of me with um, my father's mother. And my father was already dead, obviously. Um, and she did tell me about these photographs because I saw them and I asked about them. They were so beautiful. And she said, oh yeah, she went to a photo studio and she had the pictures taken. She just wanted those pictures. And I said, okay, very nice. But if you look, and then she said they were so good that the studio, um, or the store, whatever is put them in the window for all to see. Okay, and then I realized they were taken right before we left for the United States, okay? And if you looked closely at this embroidered dress that I was wearing, if you looked closely in the folds, you would see baby me with a Jewish star around my neck going to this photo studio where they put this image in the window, what was this woman thinking? Right? Again, she's, hey, I'm taking this picture of my kid. She's Jewish, she's gonna wear a Jewish star. I don't know. I have the photos, um, but I just wanted to throw that in because again, it's it's, an aspect of this woman who was so courageous. Um, 
it, it, it blows my mind. Hmm. And that was a necklace, not like a sewn on star. No, it was a necklace, which I just gave to my granddaughter last year. Oh, wow. You managed to make it out with that I necklace. made it out with the necklace. As a matter of fact. Well, that, that actually, who you gave it to is a great spot for us to maybe turn to asking about you starting a family. Okay, sure. Um, um, I, I started a family young. I had two daughters. Um, and we lived in New York City. And um, did what everybody did in New York City at that time. I mean, my husband worked, I was a stay-at-home mom, and we raised two wonderful daughters. When did you get married? In 1960. 1960. 1960. Uh, what did your husband do for a living? He was a um, fabric salesperson, so he... Um, he worked for a number of companies, um, uh, selling uh, drapery, um, upholstery, fabric, various parts of the country. Was he also a child of survivors or a survivor himself? No, 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 not at all. Do you think that had any impact on your relationship? No, I don't. I don't really think it had anything to to do with it, quite honestly. I mean, he admired my mother, but I don't think it's because she was a survivor. I, I, you know, it was so alien, sorry, um, to our life and our lifestyle at the time. That, no, nothing. Um, yeah. The interesting yeah. thing, I'm just skipping way ahead. I'm now thinking of those two daughters who are, are grown and old now and about their interest in the Holocaust, which was never um, active, for lack of a, a, a better word. And that may be, again, because I was somewhat like my mother in that I really didn't speak much about it. But interestingly... My granddaughter is very interested. And that brings us to, if I may, um, how, how I got interested in finding out more about my roots. Okay. Okay. Well, when she was a little girl, this is my granddaughter, Mia. I was living in Connecticut. She was living in New York. But every Wednesday since she was born, I would take the train in and hang out with her, okay? Um, obviously, when she was a little baby, you know, we didn't do much talking, but we yeah. forged this incredible bond, uh, hanging out together every single week. And then as she got older, and I used to pick her up from school, starting nursery school, you know, first grade, so on and so forth, um, we would talk. We'd talk about a lot of stuff. And um, when she was in third grade or fourth grade, I can't remember exactly it was, they were studying the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. And I said, oh, yeah, I know about that. And we started to talk a little bit about it. And she was very curious about it. And then um, one day her class... Uh, her teacher wanted the students to bring in any kind of material from their, their lives, their background, you know, their, their, uh, uh, membership, their parents' memberships and clubs or this or that. And my granddaughter said, do you have anything I can bring in uh, that relates to your life? And I said, yeah, I do. So I gave her my passport with the big swastika and the, the J for Jew and um, various other uh, pieces of information. Well, the interesting thing is that lo and behold, this me who was so ashamed of my background and didn't talk about it, 
my granddaughter became the star of the class. Okay? She had this stuff that turned out to be, wow, everybody was impressed. Teacher, kids, blah, 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 because they were studying that. And that, I think, imbued in her a real interest, or it may have been before, in learning about me, about the Holocaust. What she And she immediately said, someday when I'm older, can I go with you back to Germany to see where you were born and learn about it? And I said, of course, never thinking I was really going to do it because I was still <laughs> not wanting to. However, um, in she pursued it. And the more she asked, the more I felt, you know, maybe there's something there. Maybe I, I need to, maybe I t need to take it more seriously or, or, or spend more time with it. And then one, I, I was back in Germany in 1997 and I found out some stuff about my past, but I'm going to skip ahead to 2013 when my daughter, Mia's mother, said to me, you know, we should take a family trip or something. Um, what do you want to do? And I don't remember whose idea it was, but we all agreed we're all going back to Germany, to Hamburg, to learn all about it. And um, interestingly, that was, let me make sure I get this right. Okay. Well, I don't know what year it was that um, Obama ran against uh, Romney. About that time. 2012. Okay. Okay. So, um, meanwhile, little by little, after my granddaughter started asking me, I started looking things up. I started researching things. And the evening of the Obama-Romney debate, and I was for Obama, um, he really wasn't doing very well at that first debate. He, he just seemed tired. He seemed disinterested and so on and so forth. And I said to myself, you know, I can't watch this anymore. It's really upsetting me. I'm turning it off. I'm going to go to my computer and I'm going to... Um, see if there's something I can find that will be helpful, you know, for me to learn some more about my family. And I said, I've looked at, I've learned a lot about this guy and that woman and so on and so forth. I said, but there's a photograph that I've seen of me on a lawn, on a blanket with a little other, another little baby about my age. And my mother did tell me that his name was Yuri. And she did tell me, um, that um, he was the son of one of my father's uh, sisters or brothers. I can't remember exactly. So he was my cousin. And I had that photograph and I looked at it again that evening and I um, decided I was going to see if I could find anything about, out about this kid. So I went on the computer and up popped this a thing called a Stolpersteiner. Do you know what those are? Okay. Yes. Stolperstein. Um, uh -huh. uh, 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 yep. For, for Yuri Blyweiss. And I said, oh my God, he, here's this little baby and he's got this thing, which I knew nothing about. So I immediately called the Stolperstein people or, and I, I, I said, what is this all about? You know, this is my cousin or whatever, and, and he's got a stone and blah, blah, blah. And the guy who was in charge got back to me right away, and he said, um, I'm going to have somebody get in touch with you. She's um, actually writing a book partially about your family. And um, she so she's very involved with your family, and she can... Um, explain it to you. So she immediately got back to me also um, and told me she was indeed doing research on my family and ha that this baby was indeed killed in Auschwitz 
um, after after I came to the States, and um, that she could give me a lot of information about my family, which she did. She had all sorts of research, and she gave me tons of information. And so I went back to this subject because that was one of the reasons why I wound up back in Germany in 2013. Um, she, I, my daughter said, let's go. And I contacted this Suzanne and she said, just get here and I'll meet you in the lobby of your hotel. We'll know who we, we, we each are. And sure enough, we all went and we went, uh, we met in the hotel lobby. We did know exactly who we were just because. And, um, and this was also the period when Mia was saying, let's go to Germany, let's go to Germany. So it all just worked out. Everybody went. And um, she took us um, through uh, or to a number of places. We saw my father's um, gravestone. And, and P.S., among my mother's belongings, this is such a long story, among my mother's belongings, uh, that I found in 1973, there was a eulogy, a seven page eulogy uh, read by Rabbi Karlebach, who was the chief rabbi of Hamburg at the time, uh, about my father. And in 1997, when I went back, see, this is a whole lot of stuff. Um, uh, apparently, um, Hamburg uh, had a policy whereby they invited former citizens to come to spend time there, to learn about Germany, the past, and so on and so forth. And and that was in 1997. I went, but I wasn't really ready to learn all that I learned. And at that time, I also met with the, the archivist of the city um, who, who gave me some information. Um, and where I found out, this is, I'm getting confused, I mean, I'm sounding confusing, um, that uh, about my father's death and about all sorts of information that I wasn't aware of or interested in and so on and so forth. So when we went back in 2014, 13, whatever it was, um, where we met with this Suzanne and um, she took us... Uh, everywhere she showed us this okay I'm back again with yeah. her I'm on the Stolpersteine and yeah. there wasn't one for my father at the time and I contacted her and I said why is there no Stolperstein for my father and she said because he wasn't deported and killed as a, exterminated as such she he was supposedly um killed doing uh, labor. He was uh, doing forced labor, uh, day labor. He was able to come home in the evening. And somehow uh, uh, the day that they found out that we were going to finally be able to leave Hamburg was the day that he somehow got hit by a truck and was killed. Okay. So... Um, she said that's why he doesn't have a Stolperstein because it was an accident and they didn't have Stolperstein for act people who died of accidents. And I said, well, I, I, I looked up the artist and I understood that he was still doing these things and that you could buy Stolperstein. His name was Gunter Demnig in 1994. He started this program. So I said to Suzanne, I, I want to buy one for my father and place it in, in front of, of where he lived. And um, she said, okay. And within a very quick period of time, one was made for my father and she contacted me and she said, today we're, we're installing the Stolperstein, just want you to, to let you know. And I said, okay, let me pay for it. And she said, no, you know, the community pays for it. So these are, you know, such miraculous, I don't know if they're miraculous, but they're such interesting little aspects that one discovers. So when we went... And your mother also had one? No, because we weren't killed. 
But you don't have to have been anyone kin. Oh, I don't. I don't know. I thought you had to be dead. Okay. Really? Do you know Suzanne's last name and why she was writing a book about your family? Yes. Oh God. Um, Jesus Christ. I I have it written down. Um, I, I'll look it up if you if you want. And she was writing a book about the people in the community and about their lives and about their families and about, I, ha I have the book, I'll, I'll email you or let you, you know. Oh, Rosendahl was her last name, R-O-S-E-N-D-A-H-L. And she was Christian. And, um, but she felt that she wanted to do something for, for the, the victims and, 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 and to just help. And that's why she was writing the book and doing the research. I'm not, uh, my family wasn't the only ones in, in the okay. book that she was writing about. And, you know uh, about the, the Hamburg Jewish community? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, um, We've remained friends. Um, and as I said, I met her in 2013. And um, uh, she took us all around. We met other wonderful people. And um, it, it was an incredible um, uh, adventure. And um, as I said, we've remained friends. But... Um, the point I was making at that time was how I really got interested in all this. And it was Mia who said, I want to go, I want to learn. And, and, and that's what happened. And that's where it took us. And that's where, um, you know, I met Suzanne and so many people and um, not so many people, but other people and learned so much about my history. And the point I, I, I know I'm, straying but the point that i was making is that her generation mia's generation seems to be a lot more oops um seems to be a lot more connected or interested or or in finding out about my generation than my daughters they granted they are interested but it's Mia who keeps bringing it up and bringing it up, and I I, I don't know um, what that says, but it, it may be typical. I don't know. Um, um, I could ask you a couple questions about all of the things that you found out um, when you and Mia kind of began this this journey of finding out about your past, um, it might seem a difficult question, but how, um, what did you know before you started this with your granddaughter? Can you kind of compare how much you kind of already knew uh, to I everything didn't, that came after? I didn't know much at all. I wasn't interested in much. I didn't even want to know. Yeah. So, yeah. and I, For I, for example, if I could ask it one more, uh, like on that, if, if, did you even know how your father died before you? I did. I did. I did know that. C can you bring me the the black folder? I, I want to read you one sentence about. Okay. Thank you. This is a manuscript, but um. Okay, I, I'm, I'm getting befuddled. I don't know why. Um, um, essentially, what I'm trying to say, but I can't find the exact sentence, is that... Um, I credit Mia with being the person who not only 
opened my eyes to what was going on in our lives at the time, but also was the person who opened me up to myself. Yeah. You know, she she just pulled it out of me in in a you know a, a, a very simple way and helped me to essentially introduce me to my family as well as introducing me to myself and and that and that's where it began and that's where it's taken me and sort of introducing you to your mother and absolutely ways. the whole fa the family she introduced me to my mother my father um, myself and my history and because she was interested would you say that the conversations with Mia and exploring your past have sort of led to a first family processing of what happened to you all in the Holocaust? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I, I would really say so. And as I said, I, I wrote this manuscript and every Thanksgiving, my kids say, bring your manuscript and you'll read, if you don't mind, um, an essay or some of the poetry or whatever at the Thanksgiving table. So we're all, we're all learning. We're all learning about each other. And, um, it, it you know, it, it's just a, a wonderful thing. I'm very grateful for having the opportunity and the availability of all the information, um, to be able to be able to, to, to do it. But yes, the answer is yes. Mia was the one who just said, she said, as a matter of fact, on, on these Wednesdays, we used to talk, we'd talk about my mother, whom she didn't know, because my mother died before she was born. And, you know, family things, kind of. And finally, she said to me, oh, she, she wanted to know about me. How did you get here? Um, what what did you do? What did they say? You know, and finally she said to me, "Why don't you just tell me about your mother and your father and your whole family?" And that was it. And I and she was just a little girl, and I told her about my mother and my father and the whole family and what it did for me, as well as for her, was bring out. Our, our lives or my life and subsequently her life. So, um, yeah, she's, she's, she's the one that's responsible for it. So um, I want to ask if before these conversations, had you ever even thought about calling yourself a Holocaust survivor? Uh, no, you're absolutely right. I never thought about it. I, 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 I shouldn't just say no. Maybe I thought about it, but I don't recall. It was not important. At that, at that time. Um, and even when I came to America, when I was living in New York and all this stuff, I didn't want to be thought of as a Holocaust survivor. I wanted to be an American. That's all I wanted to be. There was, I, I, I so wanted to be an American. And I'll just tell you about um, one of the things that was so important in, when Harry Truman was president, and I don't remember the years, um, he issued a proclamation of sorts that noted um, that from now on, whatever the, the year was, we are going to celebrate I Am an American Day on the first or third or whatever Sunday in May. And as part of, and it is dedicated to native born Americans as well as those who've immigrated from elsewhere, with special emphasis on those who've immigrated from elsewhere, okay? And that means on that day, we are all gonna gather in Central Park, and there'll be celebrities and singers and all sorts of stuff where we're all gonna come together and celebrate each other. And the culmination was where everybody got up, stood with their hands on their heart, 
and in accents, obviously not native to Central Park, recited the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay? Mm -hmm. And that's what we did. And I was so proud, finally. I thought, I am an American. I'm really an American. And that's what a lot of these poems and, and essays uh, reveal and talk to. Um, but it made me think of some time ago, probably a year or two ago, about the difference those days were where we were all so proud to be Americans and celebrated it among each other and those people who had already been you know, Native Americans and how things had changed. So I actually wrote a letter to the editor of the Times a couple of years ago, which they published. And that was the, the, um, the gist of it, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. How I was so proud to be an American and about how, what has happened to my America, essentially. So I know I'm jumping around here, but uh, um, that that that's that's where the 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 essays um, originate, or stem from, or move on from. It's it's all about being an American. Um, there's one about being a Brooklyn Dodger fan, and they all are about the underdog. You know, I lived in Manhattan. Everybody was a New York Yankees fan. I was a Brooklyn Dodgers fan because they were not the guys of Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, all these, you know, top-notch um, players. The, 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 did, you, uh, did you stay with them bums after they moved I to sure LA? did. No, not when they moved to L.A. I stayed with them bums until they moved to L.A., and then I was angry. I didn't like that they moved to L.A., but I, I love them because they were the underdogs. They were not the, the team that everybody idolized. And they were made up of, of such a, a, a diverse group of people, of Jackie Robinson, Roy Campanella, black men, Jewish men, and uh, one Jewish man, uh, Sandy Koufax. Um, and um, the, all the essays are basically revolve around these subjects. Where there, where there's somebody who wants to be an American, and where they they're sort of underdogs, but they conquer it, and 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 that's what the Dodgers were uh, uh, to me. So I'm just looking. Let's put this. Uh, let's put this in your timeline by asking, when did you start writing? <sighs> Not till relatively recently. I shouldn't say that. Um, I was not in the art business for a long, long time, and I was also a, um, a an art critic, a reviewer for uh, a local newspaper as well as New England magazine. And so I wrote, okay, but I wrote about art. Mm -hmm. And as I was doing that, I, I suddenly just wanted to write about other things, about my family. Uh, and I realized that I kind of had a gift for it, that I was good at writing essays, that I was good at writing poetry, that I was good at um, taking a theme that somehow was in my head and writing to that theme. And that was, well, maybe 10 years ago or something like that. So you wrote it would be right to say after your conversations with Mia. Oh, yes. Yes, I wrote after my conversations with Mia. Um, yes, and um, I, I, I love it. I, I do it all the time in the middle of the night. It wakes me up and comes to me. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at, at some of the, the, the subjects. I know we're straying. Oh, are we straying? Okay. Okay. Um, Again, going to this, I am. I want to be an American. I used to go on the subways when I was going to to high school or wherever, or even younger. And they oh, in New York they always had this thing called a Miss Meet Miss Subways or Meet Miss Rheingold, and they were, oh God. and they were um, plastered ad, ads above um, the seats, and you could vote for Miss Subways. 
or Miss Rheingold, and every month there would be a different person, a, a winner or whatever. I'm not sure if it was every month or whatever. And I would love to go into the subway, see all these lovely young women, and vote. Of course, I didn't know how to vote or I couldn't vote because Miss Rheingold, you had to vote in a tavern or something like this, and I was a little girl. And, but there was nothing that made me happier than to see these women's faces up above and to, to think about how American this whole thing was. I, I, I loved Miss Rheingold, I loved Miss Subways, and I sat in my fake wicker chair um, in the subway, um, and, and, and there was something very American about them and that and the ability to vote. So that's another one of, of you, you know, uh, uh, an essays that I wrote. But the point being that be, being an American was very important. I want to follow that with asking, in all your conversations with Mia and kind of grappling with being a Holocaust survivor and where your family came from, did this feeling about difference and being an American change at all? Um, well, originally, as we know, I was ashamed of, of my past. Mm -hmm. And um, wanting to be an American, um, I'm not, I, uh, I think what has happened is I have found more pride in what I was ashamed of. In other mm -hmm. words, I'm, I'm proud to be Jewish. I'm proud to be a Holocaust survivor. And those were things that I was so ashamed of. Now, I'm glad to be an American also but the last sentence in that letter that I wrote to the editor in the, in the Times essentially said, and I'm not sure exactly, but it, 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 I was proud to, um, I, I don't remember exactly what I said, but the last sentence said, and most of all, I was proud to trade in my uh papers from the SS Muzinhu or whatever, the boat, the ship, that called me um, passenger 158 um, Hebrew, um, numbered blah, 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 to my, the papers that I received in the United States from the Department of Justice, Southern District of New York or whatever, um, number 5678 or whatever. So. Um, the point I, oh, and then I go on to say, and I wonder what has happened to my America, you know, it, it, I was so proud to become an American and now I wonder what has happened to my America. As a matter of fact, when I sent in the letter to the editor, the editor got back to me and said, you write me one more sentence and about what, what, what you think, what's, what's happening, you know? And that was when I said, I wonder what is going to happen to this country, you know, essentially that I loved so much. And yeah. I continue to wonder. But the answer to your question is, yes, um, I was ashamed to be a Holocaust survivor. I'm now proud. Um, and I was so proud to be an American. Of course, I'm still proud, but I'm not proud of what, is happening in America. So is that kind of answers it. It does, it does. And I think that's a good place because I haven't uh, remembered to ask before how your relationship to Judaism has, has kind of gone over your life. Uh, not that much happening. Um, when we came to New York, my mother enrolled me in Hebrew school because I think she felt she, she was supposed to. I went, it was okay. And I was confirmed. That's what it was called because girls weren't bat mitzvahed at that time. I, 
you know, to me, it was not such a big deal. Um, and when I got married and had children, we joined a temple here in Connecticut because, again, it was the thing we were supposed to do, supposed to send our kids to Sunday school and, um, you know, go to temple for the high holidays or something like that. But quite honestly, um, my feeling um, about Judaism, I think I'm getting more Jewish or more interested or happy about being Jewish. So, so that's what's happening. I, I've always been a secular Jew and really not cared one way or the other. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not only getting more, I'm not off, I'm getting more Jewish. I'm getting more spiritual. I talk to God. And he talks to me. Together we've mastered the art of being we. That's the start of another poem. Um, <laughs> I believe in God and God believes in me. Together we have mastered the art of being we. Blah, blah, blah. Um, but that's what's happened. It's not as so much Judaism as it is um, sp spiritualism. And that has, has, has yes, I, I say gratitude prayers, or I don't know what the word is, but I give, I offer my gratitude every day. I think it might be a hard question to ask because it just might not be something the way, the way that you thought about it, but do you think that becoming more comfortable with your identity as a survivor and as an immigrant has opened some of those doors to grappling with your newfound spirituality? Oh, I think it's very possible. I think it's very possible. I mean, I'm proud to tell people now that, oh, well, I'm a survivor. How do you think I'm feeling about all these things going on, you know? Um, which is a total, total 180, right? So, yeah. um, yes, I think little by little, it's all just, it's just kind of happened, you know? Um, And, and and it's good. good. One more question about that so that we see the whole arc. Do you know anything about, uh, maybe your mother told you at some point or your research pulled this up, uh, about whether your parents were religious before uh, things began in the 40s? I, I think they were probably secular. Also, I mean, you know, they would they were Jewish, but I, I don't think they were particularly religious. And, and, and you know, growing up in Hamburg, which was a very cosmopolitan um, city, things were not, I mean, things were horrendous and horrible, but they got that way later than they did in the more outer areas, so to speak. So I... I I don't know that I ever heard them say anything like this, but I think that they thought, eh, it's not going to happen to us, not going to happen here, you know, because they were leading really good lives. Um, I don't know if that answers. Yeah, they definitely were not religious. Okay. And it is kind of a turn, but I was just kind of picking up some threads, but... Uh... Could you tell us about your research process after you and Mia had your conversations about your past and you began to travel to Germany? Um, I want to hear about, of course, what you found out, but also how you found out about more about your mother and your father and your own, your own well, past as a survivor. Well, in 1997, when I went the first time on this free trip, um, that was being offered to all prior citizens of German, of Hamburg, at least, um, to to learn about it, to go to some of the schools, to you know, so on and so forth. They took me to my father's uh, grave, and they were the ones who actually told me about the eulogy. Originally, I found it later, but they told me about it. Um, what was I saying? Um, Your father's gravestone survives. Yeah, I got a picture of it. We all went there and 
and saw it. Yeah, it's in the Jewish cemetery, Olsdorf Jewish Cemetery um, in Hamburg. Beautiful, beautiful cemetery, lush. They've really taken good care of it, and um, it it survives. And we were, I have photos actually of all of us. And um, what was I saying? I don't remember. I don't remember what I was saying. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, going to Hamburg on the first trip. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, right, right. So, getting the G. right, right. So, on the first trip, um, they really made us feel very comfortable. They took us to the, the, the Jewish school, or what was the Jewish school? Um, they took us to the theater. We did all sorts of wonderful things. And um, they took us to a, a school where young students were actually learning about the Holocaust. It was just amazing. And as a matter of fact, two journalists interviewed me um, because they said I was the youngest person who had escaped. I, I don't know what it could be. Um, and um, they, they talked about it. I wasn't that interested at that time. I don't know. But I, I met with an archivist, a wonderful, wonderful man, who um, took me to his office. And I knew exactly where my family had lived, where I lived until I was 10 months old, in Kaiser Wilhelmstrasse. Um, and this archivist took me to the place where I lived because I knew the address, but I had known it where it was already. I, I did it before I met with him. And I met him at a luncheon that they, they gave for all of us um, guests, visitors. And he said to me, um, why don't you come to my office? I'll see, you know, we can talk some more. And that's another essay about we find our answers in unexpected places, but not get it, get into it. And um, we, okay, that letter that my mother wrote to um, City Hall, actually, he, he, he alerted me to it. I, I said I found it a moment, mother stuff. He alerted me to it because he said, well, let's talk. And I told him about all the stuff I didn't know and so on and so forth. And he said, well, just a minute, let me go downstairs to the, the basement, you know, see if I can, not, he didn't call it the basement, but the files. And up he came with the files and that's where we found the letter in its original envelope with its original postmark. Say what you want about the Germans, but they are meticulous. And um, what else did he he tell me about? I I I don't exactly remember. And he didn't have all the information, but I I, I can't remember except that is exactly where that that letter showed up. And um, you know he he talked about my father, he talked about my father's death. Um, and um, he, again, was a Christian who had started some Jewish genealogical um, group. And I, if you want his name, I, I can give it to you at some point. Um, so that was very, very interesting. And then we went to my house, you know, I went with him again. And, um, you know, he said, just write to me if you want to know anything, which I did. And, you know, as I, you know, we, we had a conversation via mail briefly for a period. And, um, and, and that was it. But I don't think I followed up again, as I said, till, till a lot later. Have you continued? Uh, doing research since then, or mm. answered the questions that you have, basically? I've answered the questions that I have, basically. Suzanne has been incredible. Um, this guy, Herr Zilaman, had, had has responded. And um, I was able to get it out. I was able to answer all the questions that I want to answer. 
Maybe there are things, obviously there are things I don't know. There's lots of stuff. But that inspired me to write about it. And that's how that came about, you know. And I, and I, I've been doing that and, and I'm very happy I did that. And I think I did a good job. <laughs> so you, uh, you write, uh, you do essays, poetry, you've written a composite memoir in that way. Yeah, but I have to get it published. Ah. <laughs> uh, and do you also speak? Uh, I just wanted to ask about what is your, now you're giving an interview, of course, but what is your connection to telling the story? That's very interesting, because I don't. I, I haven't. But lately, or, or for a little while now, I've seen others speak. And I thought, you know, I could do that. But I haven't really um, um, followed through or, or, or made an effort, and, and that's okay. For now, um, I don't need to do it, but I, I could do it. But for now, I'm sticking with the, the writing aspect. Uh, and how about you and Mia? Do you continue your conversations about the Holocaust and your family history? Well, interestingly, uh, I told you I gave her my Jewish star last uh, last year. And when this whole thing happened uh with Israel and Hamas. I got a text from her and she sent a photo of the Jewish, the, the necklace. And she said something about her heart being broken. And she is so proud to have, have this necklace and to be Jewish. She's only half Jewish. Her, her father is, is Christian, but she wrote to me, she said, I, I'm so proud to be Jewish, but I'm afraid to wear this necklace. That's that's a few weeks ago. Full circle. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly. So, um, but she'll, 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 she'll continue. She'll learn, I think, and, um, I, I I think it's you know she's proud of my story and what what she had to do with um, opening it yeah and um, there's something that came through that the fact that she said she's proud to be Jewish I was really stunned so um, that's where it is. Just to, to pick up some loose ends, uh, what are your daughter's names? Elissa and Dana, E-L-I-S-S-A and Dana, D-A-N-A. And how many grandchildren do you have? Just, just Mia. She's uh, just Mia. Alyssa. She's, yeah, Alyssa's daughter. Yeah. But they're both married to lovely Christian guys. And um, it works for all of us. We celebrate hmm. everything. I'm headed out to Colorado uh, in a, next week or whenever it is to to celebrate Christmas and Hanukkah with them. So that that Dana lives in Colorado, and the other one lives in New York, and they're Thank wonderful. You. I'm very uh -huh. very very lucky and very very blessed. Yeah. How old is Mia, and where does she live? She lives in New York City. She's 29 now. Right? She was born in 94. Um, yeah, she lives in, in, in New York. Yeah. Well, uh, Liam. Yo. Let's take one last break. Okay, we're coming back from a short break in our interview with Judy Burke. And uh, we had talked a bit about her memoir that she's... Uh, going to work on getting published. Hopefully it'll be out there when uh, when you're listening to this interview. Uh, I just wanted to ask, right here at the end of our time together today, Judy, if there's any way that you wanted to conclude your interview or any last 
uh, thoughts you wanted to leave with this uh, archive? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm so glad I did it, that it's here for posterity. Um, I, I am so grateful for where I have come and my last thought is I am so worried about our country and others and just the thought of the pain that we're all sharing um, breaks my heart and I, I pray and hope that um, somehow we'll get things straightened out for lack of a better term you know not for us and and for others and um and and again uh, to to uh note my gratitude for the miracle that is my life you know when my my mother died um uh, my uncle her brother from new york uh said, well, she was given 32 extra years because I, I haven't even gone into this thing where she had to, was arrested and sent to Poland and blah, blah, blah. Uh, unless you want to hear that too. But, um, and, and that's true. And then another thing that Mia said when she sent me this text, she said to me, your life is a miracle. And, and you know, she made me think of that. I, I, I never put it in those words, um, but she's absolutely right. I mean, first my mother, there were so many times where she was not going to survive. And, and then me, I mean, I didn't face the, the, the physical trauma exactly that, that she faced or that others faced, but I certainly was part of it. And um, she, Mia is absolutely right. My life is a miracle and, and I'm filled with nothing but gratitude. Does that suffice? It does. It does. Um, I'm really grateful for those conversations that you had with Mia. And the fact <laughs> that this probably, uh, this interview comes from that whole exploration, it seems. Yes. Uh, and on behalf of the USC Shoah Foundation uh, and all the people there, I really thank you for participating in this interview and telling your story uh, for posterity, as you put it. Uh, we're really very grateful to you for that. Well, I, I am very grateful that I was able to do this. And believe me, I would not have done it not that long ago, uh, but just bringing me to this point and giving me the opportunity to do that says something about your project. And I'm grateful for that, that, that I am able to do it and, and that it has made me feel really good. I thank you again. I'm, I'm glad that it has. Uh, and I think that's a, a wonderful note for us to end upon. Okay. Great to meet you, Chad. You as well. Thank you.